this the third Sunday in Lent. We'll begin on page 45 of the book of Alternative Services. And before we start, I invite you into a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for what we're about to do. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Page 46. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Page 97, number 4. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Blessed be the Lord, day by day, the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens. Page 48, Lent. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. O oh, come, let us worship. The Venite on page 49. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. 
but that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Well, come, let us worship. Our Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 9. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 63, verses 1 to 8. This is found on page 783 in the Book of Alternative Services. Psalm 63, 1 to 8. O God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live, and lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, 
for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them do, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask that we would understand your word, that your word would be planted in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our gospel reading, someone starts speaking about something brutal that Pontius Pilate did. Uh, Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor at the time. Uh, we often mention him in the creed. Pilate was not a nice person, and it's not surprising that he would do something really cruel. He, he used his power with a very heavy fist to remind the people under his power who he were, um, to remind them that they were under Rome's occupation, and that they were in Rome's empire. So not a nice guy, not a surprising thing that he would do something brutal. And the event that's being described seems to have been an attack by Pilate on some Galilean pil pilgrims. Uh, Galileans were sometimes known as being troublemakers. Um, sometimes rebellions happened, and the origin of that rebellion would come out of Galilee. And so um, it, rebellions have had to be put down before. And so it might be that Pilate suspected these people of being rebellious characters and it sounds like what was happening was while they were in the temple offering sacrifices that uh, maybe Pilate killed them even in the temple. 
and that their blood, uh, as it was poured out, was mixed with the blood of the sacrificed animals that they had come to, to offer. And that for Jewish sensibilities, that would be a very um, hard thing to hear. And it was a common belief in Jesus' day that if something particularly awful happened to someone, it was because they were particularly sinful. Um, you might remember the, the story in the gospel where Jesus and his disciples are walking and they see a man who was born blind and they ask him, was it his sin? Like, could he have sinned in his mother's womb or did his parents sin? And that's why he's born blind. And Jesus says, neither. Right? But it, it showed that there was this thinking in the air that if someone was dealing with something tragic, it was because that they had done something to deserve it. There was something, so they had done some sort of sinful act. Uh, and, or these tragedies were as a result or punishment for sinful actions. And this is not unlike what you hear in cultures that believe in karma, for example. Uh, if something bad happens to them, they are, in a way, getting what they deserve. Um, either something bad that they've done in this life is being balanced out, or something they did in a past life maybe was, is being balanced out. So, and there is an element of truth in that, isn't there? Um, it, it's a biblical principle that you will reap what you sow. This is from Galatians 6, 7. So the seed you plant will indicate the kind of plant that will grow, and that's just common sense, right? There are consequences um, to our actions. If, so, for example, if we don't deal with our anger, or we don't deal with our gossip, or, we, or our alcoholism, then we will probably deal with it in, in the, its consequences. We'll deal with the consequences of those actions. However, this is a general principle, and it can't be applied to every single case. Um, the whole book of Job expresses this point. What happened to him was not because of sin in his life. We see this in Jesus' life. It was not his sin that resulted in him dying on the cross. Right? So terrible tragedy doesn't automatically and necessarily mean that someone was being punished for a terrible sin. But that was often the point of view in Jesus' day. And sometimes that happens even in our own day. You know, uh, people will go gar golfing and uh, if they have a... Um, have a good game, someone might say, well, you must be living right, right? It's this idea that if something good happens, it's because you're living right, and if you're not living right, then something bad might happen. You might not have a good golf game. So we still have this way of thinking sometimes. And at this point, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem with a number of Galilean pilgrims. <laughs> so someone's telling him this story, and here they are um, as Galilean pilgrims coming to the temple. And uh, later in Luke, later in this chapter actually, we read it last week, the Pharisees warned Jesus that King Herod wants to kill him. And so now they're talking about these Galileans that were killed in the temple doing exactly what, what, what they uh, were going to be doing there. And Jesus says, don't feel like you're safe as if you're worse, as if they were worse sinners than you, and so in some, for, in some way they deserve it. Right? Don't think that they were particularly bad and they deserved it, and you are less bad as them, so therefore you're not going to endure anything tragic. Right? Don't think that that's a guarantee. He also refers to another tragedy that killed 18 people when a tower fell in Jerusalem. And he makes the same point. They weren't necessarily worse than anyone else because this tragedy happened to them. It could, have been, it could have been one of them. Their life could be taken from them at any moment. Uh, sometimes we say you could get hit by a bus walking across the street. Right? Uh, our life is not guaranteed. Just as the tower fell on, on those in Jerusalem, so something tragic could happen to us. He's saying it could have been any of them. We never know when our life is going to be taken from us, and it might be because of tragedy. It might be in a tragic way. We don't know. We hope not. But we have, that's not a guarantee that's given to us in life. 
There was nothing particularly sinful about those who died in tragic ways that made them more likely to be victims of tragedy. And implied in that, there's nothing about their life, even if they are, are not sinful, you know, sinful people, that will protect them from tragedy. On one level, Jesus is making a very practical point here that he does call everybody to repentance. If they are going to rebel against Rome in a violent uprising, regardless of how righteous they think their cause is, their righteous cause is not going to protect them from bad consequences. So if they're going to rebel violently against Rome, their fate may very well be like those whose blood was spilled in the temple and those who were crushed by falling buildings in Jerusalem. And in fact, there was a violent uprising against Rome and Jerusalem was destroyed along with the temple in 70 AD. And you can, if you go to Jerusalem, you can still see the dents in the, in the pavement underneath the Temple Mount where those giant stones were pulled down as the temple was pulled apart and the walls were pulled down. Um, where you can see these giant stones fell down. And so when you think about the tower falling down, you can think about the, the, the stones of the Temple Mount falling down and Jerusalem being, being raised and many people dying in that, in that horrible event. So it was, it was a terrible massacre. And Jesus may be saying that if you repent and adopt his way of peace, you might avoid this coming destruction. Uh, but unless you repent, that same thing might happen to you as happened to those in the temple and happened to those uh, to whom the, the temple fell on them. So Jesus' warning might have a real historical reality for his listeners, but there's also a deeper spiritual principle here that, that goes beyond the specific historic situation that they were facing in Roman-occupied Israel. We are continuously warned about not being fruitful in the Bible. Jesus' parable is another warning about not bearing fruit. The owner of the vineyard comes to check on his fig tree. The mature tree is supposed to produce figs each year, but it hasn't produced figs for three years. The idea seems to be that the tree is living a selfish life. Sometimes the tree, a fig tree, is sometimes used as a symbol of the, the temple as well. So when he's talking about this tree, uh, he might be talking about the temple. It's using up the nutrients and the water and the soil, and it's not giving anything back. It's just living this selfish, self-preserving existence. The owner wants to cut the tree down, but the gardener asks for one more year to give it a chance. He will break up the soil around the roots to fertilize the tree, he's going to give it another chance. But if it still doesn't produce figs, then they plan to cut it down. And this could be a parable about, is the temple producing fruit? And Jesus coming might be the fertilizer that's trying to rejuvenate the, this temple and this people, the leadership, to be the light to the nations that they were called to be in Isaiah. Um, and so, are they, this is the question, is it, is, is the leadership, is the temple going to produce fruit now that this fertilizer has appeared? So this is a parable, but we can take it that way historically, but we can also take it um, as applying to us as individuals and, and us in our time as the church as well. It's a parable about God's patience with us. He is giving us chance after chance to amend our lives. And I wonder if we sometimes presume too much on God's mercy and God's forgiveness. You know, God is merciful, God's nice, God's, God's forgiving, so maybe I don't have to, I don't have to worry so much about uh, correcting myself. Sometimes we could take our sin a bit more seriously than we do. But maybe we don't feel like there's an immediate reason to because God is so merciful and loving and forgiving. Sometimes we know that there is good that we could be doing. We might even have a sense that God is calling us to do that good, but we don't do it. We don't sense the immediacy of needing to do it. In procrastination, maybe we presume on God's mercy and God's forgiveness that 
it's okay, I can kind of live the way I want to. Um, just because God is patient with us, it doesn't mean that God doesn't take sin seriously or that there aren't serious consequences to our sin. Are bad things done or good things left undone? In a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he is speaking about the ancient Hebrews who left slavery in Egypt and wandered through the wilderness. He's talking about them consuming spiritual food and drink. He even talks about them being baptized. They, bought, they were baptized in the cloud and going through the sea. So here's these baptized people who are consuming spiritual food and drink. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> he might be relating the manna and the baptism and the water from the rock, relating that to our baptism and to Holy Communion, our, our spiritual food and our spiritual drink. He then speaks about the Hebrews as being examples to us. They received God's leading and instruction just as we do. They were considered God's people just as we are. They received God's food and drink just as we do. They were sustained by him. And yet, God was not pleased. The people continued to grumble. They continued to be disobedient. They continued to be rebellious and ungrateful. And for that reason, many of them never made it out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And our tendency can sometimes be to look down on them as if we know better. You know, as, as if, if we were there, we wouldn't be the disobedient people, would we? We wouldn't grumble. We wouldn't be ungrateful. And Paul is telling us to be careful. He's giving us a warning. If you think you are standing, he says, watch out that you do not fall. This is part of our reading, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. He is wanting us to learn from them so that we don't fall into the same sins and endure the same consequences. We receive spiritual food and drink, but that does not exempt us from God's expectation that we would bear fruit in keeping with being made to be the people of God. The Hebrews in the wilderness received spiritual food and drink as well, but they were not exempt from such expectations. So God's patience is the difference between us and the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness who receive the consequences of their sin. God's patience won't last forever. At some point we will run out of time and so we should not delay. There is a point where we will have to face the consequences of the life we've lived, every word that we've uttered. So now is the time to repent and produce fruit. Paul's point about our spiritual ancestors wandering in the wilderness is that we could have been them. We could have received the same consequences. They likely made the same excuses that we make. They look to their neighbor for determining if they're doing okay or not, right? rather than looking to God's instruction. Right? And I bump into people sometimes who, who say, well, I'm not Hitler, I've never killed anyone. It's like, wow, that's a pretty low bar to be, to be judging your life by. So uh, we need to be careful about looking down on the Hebrews as if we're that different, don't we? Instead, we should learn from their example, learn from their mistakes, take their example to heart. We consume the nourishment of God to produce fruitful lives. Let's not be a people who consume spiritual things, but don't, spare, don't, but don't bear spiritual fruit in keeping with being God's people. So the question we are left with from Jesus' parable is, are we producing fruit for the kingdom of God? How do our life and words show the goodness and beauty of God? How does our faith have people around us? We should maybe look at this not just as individuals, but also as a community. How does this speak to us as a church? Are we producing fruit for the kingdom by our life as a church? By our words and our actions as a church? If we were the only church someone ever walked into, 
What would they think of Christianity and of Christians? As a church, are we benefiting others? Or are we just benefiting ourselves? Are we just consuming God's nutrients and not producing fruit to bless the world? Lent is a time to ask hard, uncomfortable, evaluative questions. It's not comfortable. Lent is a time for us to submit ourselves to God's light as we ask God to show us our lives. We ask God to show us our thoughts and our words and our deeds. We ask God to help us with our things done and things left undone. Is there anything I'm doing that I should stop doing? Is there anything I'm neglecting that I should be doing? Is there any way in which I'm just coasting, just using up the nutrients of the soil, using up the spiritual food and drink, using up the grace of God's sacraments and not producing any fruit? These are uncomfortable questions. And I ask them of myself as well. But they're questions that need to be asked. And we need to ask these as a church, not just as individuals. Lord have mercy. Amen. I invite you to consider in a moment of silence what God might be saying to you. And then we will turn to page 52 for the creed. Page 52, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll leave space during the intercessions for you to bring forward to God anything that you wish to pray for. With confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy.
for those preparing for baptism, and for their teachers and sponsors. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners, and all in danger. That they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Father of mercy, alone we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. When we are discouraged by our weakness, strengthen us to follow Christ, our pattern and our hope, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now on page 54, at the bottom of the page. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Thank you very much for joining me for morning prayer on this, the third Sunday of Lent. God bless you.